This year I learned a term that I found out is actually fairly common for describing anime and manga among Japanese speakers. The term is spokone, a portmanteau of the words cone, the Japanese word for guts, and sports, meaning sports. Based on the writings of Toei producers like Takeyuki Suzuki and Toru Hirayama, spokone is more of a vibe rather than a full-on genre. It rose to popularity in Japanese fiction in the late 60s and is characterized by protagonists who struggle with adversity, but with hard work and determination overcome all obstacles in their path and forming bonds with others who share their hot-blooded passion. The late 60s saw an explosion of sports-related media in Japan, mostly attributed to the popularity of the 1964 Olympics held in Tokyo. Spokone is the lifeblood of sports anime, rising to prominence in popular culture through anime like Attack No. 1 and Star of the Giants. But by the 70s, these elements were already being codified into other genres of Japanese fiction until they'd eventually become universal themes of manga and anime. When Yoshinori Watanabe and Toru Hirayama were tasked with developing a new hero series, they immediately turned to sports anime and dramas for inspiration. And this would ultimately become the framework of 1971's Kamen Rider. In Kamen Rider, the main character Takeshi Hongo is kidnapped and turned into a cyborg because of his high intelligence and his athletic capabilities. Athletic themes and sports anime tropes are all over the series, with Toru Hirayama citing the live-action drama Judo Straight Line and the anime Tiger Mask as their major influences. It wouldn't be long until even the mecha genre would be dominated by characters displaying these traits, like the team that pilots Get a Robo. In Get a Robo, three hot-blooded youths utilize teamwork and guts to defeat the invading army of the Dinosaur Empire, and Toei's TV adaptation puts an even greater focus on the themes of athleticism and self-improvement, with several episodes focusing on characters conquering their own personal fears, like when Musashi has to overcome his fear of reptiles, Ryo having to overcome his fear of falling, Musashi's inferiority complex, Musashi not being able to ride a bicycle. Beyond the 1970s, I'm sure you can think of a lot of anime that have a Spokone vibe, especially shown in martial arts titles. These traits have evolved beyond genre tropes, but rather are intrinsically linked to Japanese culture as an image that all should strive to achieve. People who exhibit this Spokone spirit are people we should gravitate towards, people we should emulate, and it makes sense why Japan would emulate strong characters who work as a team, considering they're a small island country who has frequently endured attacks from both other countries and God himself. This idolization of strength, conformity, and collaboration is why Japan has been so resilient, and why they're able to survive so much hardship. Get a Robo is formed by three ships combining, and each pilot must perform at his peak, or risk the fate of his comrades and all of Japan. It is a very Japanese robot. And I'm not even reading into this too much. The anime has an episode where they meet Jack King, a pilot from America who mocks the team for needing three pilots, when his robot, Texas Mac, only needs one. The episode of course ends where Jack gets in over his cowboy hat, and the Getter team have to sweep in and save the day, and he learns a valuable lesson. Now, all of that may have seemed like over-explaining, but I really wanted to emphasize how much of an influence sports had on anime, especially in the 70s. The reason is because I want to put into perspective how crazy it is that at that same time when sportsmanship was being hailed as the new Bushido, there was an anime that not only lacked Spokone themes, but it asserted that they would lead to the stagnation of mankind and the collapse of modern society. Space pirate Captain Harlock is set in the year 2977, a time where humanity has succumbed to apathy. The Earth government provides people with necessities, and they watch TV that delivers satisfying and non-challenging entertainment. Our protagonist, the titular space pirate Captain Harlock, believes that humanity's inability to face challenges will inevitably lead to its end. To prevent this from happening, Harlock rebelled and fled to space. The crew of Harlock's ship, the Arcadia, are 42 men disdained by a society that they have likewise rejected. They are alcoholics, they are ugly, disabled, obsessive nerds, and horny aliens. Harlock's crew is composed of every type of person a proud, conforming society should pity at best and revile at worst. And yet, they are not only portrayed as the good guys, but it is insisted that only through individuality can humanity grow. When Captain Harlock invites Tadashi Daiba to join him, all he asks is that Daiba fight for what he believes in. Harlock only wants his crew to fight for what's in their heart, meaning they aren't serving him or his goals, or the goals of their other crewmates even. They don't need to share a dream, but they do need to want something with a passion, and Harlock will nurture that passion and help them achieve that dream. <laughs> お前の胸の中にあるものの
僕はこの自由の旗の下で僕の信じる者のために戦う大バトだし、どれ海賊戦艦アルカディア号の同志として The rejection of conformity is a common theme seen in many of the works by Harlock's manga author Leiji Matsumoto. It's a common theme in a lot of pop fiction, actually. But for Matsumoto, it came from a very real place. Matsumoto's father, Lieutenant Tsuyoshi Matsumoto, was a pilot in the Japanese Air Force. During World War II, it was the senior Matsumoto's job to assign pilots to their duties in the Pacific Theater, many of whom he knew wouldn't come back. Sending young men on suicide missions weighed heavily on Matsumoto, and the pain and anxiety only became stronger when the war ended. After losing the war, Matsumoto was obligated to visit the families of all the men who died under his command and inform them of their loved one's death. Most of the families blamed Matsumoto, and the guilt he felt made him unable to work for the rest of his life. The senior Matsumoto, a lover of planes and all things aviation, would never fly again, even turning down simple commercial airline jobs due to the guilt and trauma he felt. Having experienced the fallout of World War II firsthand, Liji Matsumoto conveys the danger of a government that erases individuality. We could all be happy and equal if we conform, act like ants performing our dedicated duties to ensure the prosperity of our colony. But Harlock reminds us that we are not insects, and that life is something not to be wasted. The prevalence of these themes is why I always specify that Liji Matsumoto is the co-creator when talking about the 1974 anime Space Battleship Yamato. While many sources push Matsumoto to the forefront, and there's political reasons why that happens, Matsumoto was actually brought on while the series was already in the midst of development. Prior to Matsumoto joining the production, the series was headed by another man credited as co-creator, Yoshinobu Nishizaki. Nishizaki's name was, for a period of time, omitted when talking about Yamato, because Nishizaki was, uh, a little too based. <laughs> Yeah, Nishizaki's gun and drug charges led to Matsumoto receiving more credit for Yamato, and the reason I bring this up is because there's a lot of political opinions and elements of Japanese nationalism in Yamato that I personally believe Matsumoto would have completely opposed. Episode 2 has a whole scene talking about the brave men who fought alongside the original battleship Yamato, how they knew they would die in battle and that they knew they were on a suicide mission, but they followed orders dutifully, with the scene and its sentiment meant to reflect on our protagonist boarding the space battleship Yamato, and how now our protagonist will fight with that same spirit. This is not a Matsumoto sentiment. All people will die and should live life to the fullest. Therefore, you should not take death lightly. Asking if a person would die for others is nonsense. Depending on the situation, the person can choose for themselves. While Yamato is a story of how many people can work together to achieve an impossible task, Harlock, conversely, is about a crew who doesn't need a single unifying goal. Each member has their own aspiration, and the passion they have for that dream is all they need to motivate them to work together. While the crew of the Yamato works together through a societal obligation, the crew of the Arcadia is working out of a personal obligation. But what's interesting about Harlock as an anime is that we can actually see the internal conflict between societal expectations and personal conviction in the arc of a single character, Commander Karuda. Commander Karuda is a member of the Earth military and is essentially a main antagonist for the majority of the series. However, despite being an antagonist, he isn't really a bad guy. The best comparison I can think of is if Harlock was Lupin III, Karuda is Zenigata. Karuda seeks to capture Harlock, but not just because it's his job, he's not blindly following orders. Karuda genuinely cares about the safety of Earth's people, especially children, and opposes Harlock because he believes Harlock is a threat to that safety. He serves the Earth government, but retains his individuality, making him a more sympathetic and even tragic character. He embodies the spirit of individuality so much that, even though he was being hunted by him, Harlock eventually comes to understand him. When the Mazone first appear to Karuda in what is probably the scariest fucking scene in the entire show, they force Karuda at gunpoint to turn over all records on Harlock and his crew. Karuda notices that Harlock's goddaughter Mayu is included, and immediately tries to run away, knowing she'd be an easy target for the Mazone. When Karuda is unable to escape, he pleads with the Prime Minister to end the charade. He wants the Earth government to reveal the Mazone's existence, so that the Earth's people can oppose them with military force. However, the Prime Minister refuses, unconcerned about the possible loss of one child in the face of a planetary war. From this point on, Karuda grows to despise the Earth government, and the Mazone begin to take notice, even trying to convince him to join their side at one point. And this is how those negotiations go down.
球を裏切れだと<笑>わしも安く見られたもんだ。Let's swing back to Yamato for a sec. The series opens with Mamoru Kodai sacrificing himself so Captain Okita can escape to fight another day. Kodai's death in the first episode of Yamato not only has an underlying sense of nationalism, but the reveal towards the end that he survived and is actually living with this beautiful alien named Starsha has this unintentional arc where Mamoru sacrifices himself for the greater good and as a result sort of achieves Valhalla. This isn't what the creators intended, but it could easily be read this way. This is ironic because in the original outline for the series, Mamoru was meant to re enter the story, becoming a main character, and take part in the climax of the series, but this was removed when the series lost 13 episodes due to low ratings. I call it ironic because upon his return, Mamoru Kodai was meant to adopt a new moniker, and that moniker was Space Pirate Captain Harlock. I'm actually glad that Harlock's anime debut wasn't in Yamato, because I think it would have tied Harlock as a character down to a lot of Yamato's themes. Imagine if the man who gave his body and soul to protect his commander was now telling his crew to die for no one but themselves. The 1978 Harlock anime wouldn't even exist, or if it did, it would be something completely different than what we got. And what we got was something special. Harlock was the hero anime fans needed. He is the person that tells you that your hobby or your niche interest, the one that everyone says is childish and a waste of time, actually isn't. Harlock is the patron saint of anime fans. One of my favorite scenes is at the end of episode 16. After foiling an evil scheme set up by her ex boyfriend, Harlock finds Kay sitting on the beach in a kimono, holding her mother's shamisen. With the sun setting and waves crashing, Kay simply asks Harlock to listen to her play, and so he does. Adaptations seem to forget why Harlock meant so much to anime fans. It wasn't because he was cool and that he killed a bunch of people without hesitation. Empty Geist is cool and kills a bunch of people without hesitation, and I'm the only one who loves and respects him. Harlock was cool because it came out at a time when every show told kids to improve themselves, become stronger, become more sociable. While Harlock said if you aren't strong and sociable, that's fine. Do what you're good at, do what you personally love doing. While the Spokone vibe of the 70s was meant to instill this sports team mentality into kids, Harlock reminded them that they are individuals and that they shouldn't let any system erase that. Even beyond childhood inspiration, I feel like Harlock really resonated with me because of how much he detests stagnation. Humans becoming too stagnant is the entire reason he fled to space in the first place. And I've met so many people in my life who I felt could achieve great things, but they just refused to do it because they were lazy or didn't think it was worth it. But as cliche as it sounds, I would rather meet someone who tried a million times and failed than a person who didn't even bother. In the final episode of the series, Harlock abandons his crew on Earth. With the Mazone defeated and the government toppled, they no longer need to serve Harlock or the flag of freedom, because now they can live peacefully and achieve their dreams. I want to make one last comparison to Yamato. I find it interesting how Captain Okita's goal is to survive his illness long enough to see the mission through to the end so that he can peacefully die on Earth. While Captain Harlock's goal is to see his mission through to the end so that his crew can peacefully live on Earth. <laughs> 